Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and I wanted to use this video to discuss planets that are orbiting pulsars and the fact they're actually very rare and how do they actually get there because it's quite unusual or confusing as to why they might be there in the first place if we understand what a pulsar is and how pulsars actually form. So we need to kind of revisit what a pulsar is first before we understand how the planets end up in orbit around the pulsar. So pulsars concern large massive stars. So the very massive or the most massive stars that we have when they die they will produce black holes, neutron stars and pulsars basically. So when they're on the main sequence these big massive stars are in hydrostatic equilibrium. That means that they're generating energy in their core they're producing obviously energy and this causes an outward radiative pressure. This balances out the gravitational forces and the star is in hydrostatic equilibrium. Now when the fusion stops in the core then there's nothing to support the star against gravitational collapse. So what happens is the core collapses, you get a, a, a dense core depending on the, the size or the mass of the actual star depends on what you actually end up with but it's most likely going to be a neutron star or for the very big stars it's going to be a black hole. The outer layers of that star are ejected into this supernova remnant. So this is the Crab Nebula here and this was from a type 2 supernova and it left this obviously really nice looking nebula there. That's the outer layers of the star but right in the center of that you've got a pulsar, which is essentially the collapsed core of that star. So what are pulsars then? Well, they're very fast neutron stars. They can spin up to hundreds of times a second. So very, very fast rotating. They have these polar jets that we see as a pulse. So what happens is they, they have these radiation beams coming from their magnetic axis. They are then rotating very fast but their magnetic axis is offset from their rotation axis. So it's a bit like a lighthouse. They sweep out these beams of radiation and we detect that as a pulse, hence the name pulsar. Now they're very small as well because they've collapsed. There's no longer any outward pressure balancing the gravitational force. So they, they collapse down to basically the size of a city, but they will still have the mass of around about the sun, what be more than the sun. So it might be one to two times the mass of the sun, essentially. So very, very heavy or very massive, but very, very small and fast rotating. So why do they spin so fast? Well, when the core collapses, you have to conserve angular momentum. So if the angular momentum stays the same, but it collapses and gets smaller, then it has to spin up, say, this, or spin up a lot faster to conserve that angular momentum. So if you've ever been on one of those um, roundabouts at a park and you spin it up really fast, if you then go towards the center, move the mass towards the center, you can spin them up quite fast. Same idea here. You've got the same mass, you've just collapsed it, so it has to spin up faster, and that's why they spin so fast. So the misaligned rotation axis and the magnetic axis is what leads you to the pulses that you see. So this is like a a visual representation of what I just explained really. That magnetic axis is tilted over and as it rotates those beams sweep out a bit like a lighthouse from Earth. If that beam is aligned that it sweeps out over us we detect that as a, as a pulse, a very fast energetic pulse per rotation basically. So that's why we can detect them and why they're called pulsars. Now pulsars themselves are not particularly rare. In fact there's around about 4,000 or so have been discovered so far. There's lots of them been detected, so they're not rare. And this is just a snapshot of like a pulsar catalog, and the link is there if you want to actually go and have a look yourself. All different sorts of pulsars, all with very uninteresting catalog names, depending on you know how they were formed, things like that. But anyway, pulsars, they're not rare, basically, is, is the whole point of this. Planets orbiting pulsars, however, are. So if you go to the Exoplanet Archive, you can search for that online. And this is a catalogue of exoplanets that have been detected, ones that are candidates that are not fully confirmed. And this only lists a handful of pulsars that are, well, that have planets, basically. And whilst it's only a small handful, 
one of those pulsars actually has three planets. So that accounts for almost half of them that we know so far. So only a very small amount of these pulsars are known to have planets. So how do they actually get there? Because it's a little bit confusing as to how they might get there because massive stars, which are, well, these will end up forming your pulsars. They typically don't have planets and they don't have planets for a few reasons, actually. One is they're very difficult to detect. So it could be that we actually just can't detect them. Planets are very faint in comparison to a star. They're much smaller. They're not as luminous and they're not as bright. If you've got a very faint planet, very close to an extremely bright star, they're very hard to actually see. So it could be that we're just not detecting them. That's one reason why we don't see them anyway around massive stars. It could also be that the strong radiation from the star actually destroys any planet forming disk that would be there. So you don't get those disks around massive stars long enough for planets to actually form. So it could be that we just can't see them and they can't form anyway. So we do know that these massive stars that end up forming pulsars are possibly unlikely to have planets because we just haven't really detected them around the massive stars, let alone the massive or the, the pulsars anyway. Now, let's say that we actually did have planets around one of these massive stars. If it had or if it was close, closer than four AU to the star during the red giant phase, they would be engulfed by the star. So one AU is one astronomical unit, which is the average distance between the Earth and the sun as it orbits around. So four times that distance, then any planets would actually be engulfed and destroyed by the star when it ages to the red giant by phase and it swells up. So those ones would be gone anyway. So we'd lose those at that point. Also, during the supernova, the star that's going to form into the actual pool, so you know, during the actual supernova part anyway, it loses half of its mass. So it loses a considerable amount of mass, which is ejected into this supernova remnant, this nebula we see around the actual pulsar or the neutron star, or even the black hole, depending on how big the actual star is. So it loses a lot of mass. That's a problem for any planets that are orbiting. So any first generation planets that were there, these are planets that formed with the massive star and actually managed to remain there during and up to the point of the supernova would likely be lost anyway. And this is because the Hill sphere would shrink. The Hill sphere is the gravitational influence or the sphere of influence around an object where any other second smaller object will be gravitationally bound to it. If that Hill sphere shrinks because it's a function of the mass of the pulsar, so if that mass decreases, then the planet needs to be closer in order to be gravitationally bound to it, basically. So during this supernova, assuming the supernova doesn't destroy the planet anyway, then it's likely these planets would be lost into space anyway, because they just wouldn't be gravitationally bound to the pulsar anymore, because it's just less massive. Now, second generation planets could potentially form around the newly produced pulsar and this is because some of that ejected supernova material is going to fall back onto the pulsar so some of it gravitationally falls back down and when it falls back down it produces this disk which is a little bit like a protoplanetary disk that the planets would initially have formed in anyway the only issue with this is that the disk that is formed is quite low mass, quite small. There isn't necessarily enough material there, or it's not a bit a, a massive enough disk to form a planet. That's the only issue here. But potentially, in theory, we could have a disk which a planet could form in and form a second generation planet around the newly formed pulsar. Now, the third one would be, let's say we've got a, a binary system. This is a pulsar and a much larger star. And the pulsar, for some reason, might end up penetrating the outer envelope of this massive star. It could be that the orbits have spiraled inwards, so they've got closer to each other over time. It could be that the, the bigger star has kind of swelled up a bit into the red giant phase. Either way, the pulsar has penetrated the outer layer of this star. That scattered material outwards, and then it actually produces a disk. And this disk is better for planet formation because in this scenario, 
it forms a much larger disk and you've got a better chance of forming planets this time round because it's a much more massive disk compared to the supernova remnant that will be left behind. So that would be our third generation planet, potentially. Well, not necessarily third generation, but third scenario which could place planets around our pulsar. And then the next one is that it could just be a rogue planet, a free-floating planet that doesn't have a star, and there's actually lots of those floating around. And if it got close enough to the pulsar, it could be gravitationally captured. Again, if it comes close enough within the Hill Sphere with the right velocity, the right trajectory, it could end up on a new orbit orbiting the pulsar. It just has to get close enough, that's all. So this could just be a planet that formed around another star and it was ejected from its own system for some reason or another and now it's ended up orbiting the pulsar. So it never formed with the pulsar, but it's been gravitationally captured instead. And then the last one, really, is to do with the pulsar and well, its binary companion again. But this time round, the pulsar basically consumes and destroys its companion star and it leaves behind a planetary mass object. So it's not, a, it's not really a planet, but it's a planetary mass remnant. What, what is it actually doing? Well, this pulsar consumes this star a bit like a Black Widow spider would. So they're called Black Widow pulsars because they consume their companion in the same way or the same behavior that a Black Widow might do to its mate. So they're known as Black Widow spiders and they, well, sorry, Black Widow pulsars, I should say. And they behave like the Black Widow spiders and they leave behind that planetary mass object. But it doesn't mean it's technically a planet because it could still be what is part of the actual star it's the central part of the star most likely left behind so thank you for watching and if you have any questions for future videos or anything then just leave them in the comments